Um, I'll, I'll start, let's give minutes. Uh, one, two, three. I'm going to be um, not talking about Libtro, unfortunately. <laughs> this is a lie. This is a lie. I'll be talking about, about generic ARM. Um, in, in this case, I mean uh, 32 bit ARM, and even though I'm known for 64 bit rec more recently. Um, so we've got this um, problem, you know, we've got ARM, and we, what we want to do is boot on all the things. And return true on all the things, right? Yes, and return true on everything. Uh, so, quick, quick introduction about me. I'm now a research, research associate in the University of uh, Cambridge in the computer lab, uh, working for uh, Robert Watson and I've also, in the part, up until fairly recently, been sort of still am a uh, freelance software engineer. So a lot of this was uh, none of none of this was related to either of these positions. But this, I've uh, been a FreeBSD committer for <laughs> nearly seven years, um, by focusing on ARM things, ARM and ARM64 mainly. Um, I don't really know anything about Intel. People keep asking me, comparison between Intel and ARM. I say, you have to tell me about Intel first. Uh, I've done these two major projects of, I break everything on our, everyone's ARM binaries and then I ran off to ARM64. Um, but this is, as I said, this is separate from these. This is my, uh, if I, my, my, I don't feel like doing work, so I'm doing something fun instead and playing with more programming. I've done, so, a small history on um, MV6. Um, we started 2011, so that was, the first MV6 CPUs were, in the, have been, well, they've been in the market since 2002, according to the ARM website. Uh, so we were fairly late to this. Um, and even though ARMv6 existed, there wasn't really any, any hardware that was generally available um, at all. So it wasn't until ARMv7 came around that we were, was really the interest in, in the port. Uh, started with Amada XP and a few, some TI parts and NVIDIA. Um, and it's, uh, You'll notice that, so these are all ARMv7 CPUs, so even though it's ARMv, called ARMv6, it means ARMv6 and later is um, in 32-bit mode. Um, most of, many of these have actually been removed or are currently not really building properly, so it shows, you know, some of, some of the old code may be a wee bit dead, but it's, these were the original three ARM platforms. Uh, We've imported, so we imported it into our uh, subversion in 2012. So it's been almost, we've had it almost five years. Uh, we have added a few more SOCs. Here's a few, so you can see the Broadcom ch chips are only really in Raspberry Pis that, or for FreeBSD. Um, there's some um, Freescale, which I think is now in XP and is soon to be Qualcomm. Uh, some Samsung parts, some all winner parts. I don't know um, how many how many all winner parts do we support. Yeah, too many <laughs> to list. Uh, we support some Intel FPGA parts. Um, the and uh, the second one is the um, Amazon owned company now. Uh, Rockchip, Xilinx, uh, FPGAs, QMU, and, and Gem5. Um, so we support. A reasonable number. We're not everything, but we've um, we only have a limited number of people uh, working on this. So, just, you know, too, we if we we don't want to spread ourselves too thin with supporting every every part, every SOC. Um, but the problem is, you know, we don't have a generic. So, what you know, generic, what is needed for generic? Well, we need, yeah. You know, Early hardware configuration, um, configuration. So we need something. As you boot in, you need to do a wee bit of work early, fairly early on, um, just to get to the point where you can get to some common code. You need to find some some sort of device enumeration. So 
later on, later in the kernel, we're booting. We need to figure out what hardware do we actually have in this, this system we're booting on, because a lot of ARM hardware is not uh, is not enumerable um, without some sort of external um, information. So. And there's, yeah, there's some, uh, ACPI does provide some of this information on Intel, um, but and also um, self-enumerating buses like PCI Express um, help with this. Um, but you can't rely on on this being, yeah, can't re on it for the, for all devices. Um, and we've got these singleton functions where each each SOC implemented. The same function in slightly different ways, or even in the same way. Um, we need to sort of we need to break these a little and, and create some new interfaces. So yeah, early hardware is yeah. So we've, we're booting the kernel. We're booting. You forgot uboot, for example, is is a, a, a first level bootloader. We then that runs uh, the uboot loader, so ubldr. And then it jumps into the kernel. And then we need to do some early, some sort of figuring out, you know, we're still running in physical addressing at this point. So we've got this, you know, this problem of, you know, the kernels all had a hard-coded physical address they expected to be loaded in. Yeah. It's great, except um, if you're wanting to run one kernel on one piece of hardware, and you can guarantee you're always loading at a fixed address. Uh, but even if you're not wanting to run the same kernel on multiple different types of hardware, just being able to say, you know, not have to hard code addresses is nice. Uh, so I came, we came up with a solution. And, uh, we do some web of runtime detection of what, what address are we actually running from, and then we can build a, p a page tables around that. And then once we've done that, we're in the into your virtual address space. And we know we've got a physical, well, we've got a virtual address, so we can, we can force it to be the address we want. Um, that has um, some issues, though. And that it's, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, but luckily, uh, so what we do, we have to figure out where we've been loaded, the physical address space, address, um, you yeah, know, find out where in the physical address space we've been loaded to. And then we have to, you know, build, do this, build this page table. Um, so how do we do that? It turns out ARM is really nice for this. And in 32-bit ARM, uh, we have a register, which is, uh, you can just use as a source register. Um, and it's uh, you can use it for move as a source for move, so you can load, you can just you can query what the uh, you can query what the value of the program counter is, um, or you've got some uh, program counter relative memory accesses. There is a slight issue with 32 bit time where the program counter doesn't point at the current instruction, but uh, at what the current at the start of the pipeline on early ARM processes would have be, and they were three-stage pipelines, that's two instructions after the current instruction that you're ex executing. Um, so it's always, it's a wee bit confusing if you look at this and suddenly everything's off by two instructions, but, so that's what, yeah, we can, for a lot of this, we can handle that. Um, using, it's mostly using PC relative and the, the assembler handles the knowing exactly what, uh, what, what the PC will be at, the, at this given instruction. Um, but then we need to, so we've got, we can figure out what the, the virtual address, the physical address will be, but we still need to actually build, we need to figure out, you know, we need to build this, this um, mapping because we need to get into uh, virtual address space somehow. So, we, we have to create these two mappings. We have to create a large, I think, I think currently we're building a mapping for the entirety of address space. Um, and then within that, we create a small uh, 64 megabyte mapping of uh, where it is that the kernel will be running f ultimately be running from. Um, but we use the information. We've, we know 
the, virtual, the physical address that we, we wanted to create the map to. And it's all, it's, it's a wee bit hairy code, but it, it all works. And you know, um, once, once you know a delta between virtual and physical addresses, it's relatively easy. Uh, and we can, yeah, so we can, we can do this, and we've, it survives. Um, it's quite, if you're really interested in actually how we do it and issues I've, I know in the code, you can come and talk to me afterwards. It's a lot of explanation to actually go through this. So I'll, I'm skipping it over this a little bit at the moment. Um, but that's fine, okay, so we can now get into some, we can start running C code. Um, but we, we come to a second problem in that Everyone just copies and pastes the, the code, and they made their minor changes. Um, and so we, the first piece of C code we run in FreeBSD on ARM is called Inner's ARM. I think we had, I'm not sure how many copies of that we had. Um, I don't know. One, one I think is 50. I'm not sure if it was quite 50, but it was, it was many, too many. You know, more, any more than one is, prob is too many, and I think we're down to two now, maybe, maybe a few more. Uh, so I came up, you know, because most of the, uh, the ARMv6 are almost identical, but not quite, I came up with a, I, I did this, and I pulled out the common code and created some new uh, per so, um, you know, the new functions to handle the per, per SIC code. This originally it wasn't, it was just C, uh, C function, so there's still the problem of singletons. But, so we still have, uh, yeah, we need to, still need to implement these same function. Um, but we can, like, you know, it turns out PowerPC has already done this. Yeah, that's how PowerPC does it. We just create a KObj based, you know, FreeBSD supports. Uh, multiple device drivers using KOBJ, um, and it's a generic thing, so we can just use it as PowerPC does in the early boot code. Um, and this turns out to be you know, surprisingly easy. And, um, it's, it, it's yeah, it, we, it gives you support of then of things like if even within a a if you've got two very similar. SOCs. You can then even start running a kernel with these between them, the same kernel on two two, two platforms, even if it's not a, entirely generic. So yeah, this code is all called from the inner time, so the very first bit of C code. Um, I started it in a. I created a, a project branch called specific, specific leg, as a play on generic ARM. It, um, so it did prove that, you know, so this project branch proved this was possible because this was all, it's all sort of speculation that we, we thought we would be do, it would, this, this method would work. Um, and I managed to at least show that with minor, with, with minor changes, I could run the same kernel on both Pandaboard and a Raspberry Pi. Uh, the main issue was, um, Raspberry Pi, that's a Raspberry Pi 1, which is ARMv6, and Pandabor is an ARMv7, and I've got some issues with the cache, so you have to rebuild, uh, to be depending on exactly how you handle uh, cache inter interactions with the cache. Um, so that's why it's almost the same kernel, not, not the same kernel. Um, so what does a you know, platform actually look like? Is Here's a... A very, uh, here's the absolute minimum SMP example I think we can provide. Um, this is actually, this comes from the QMU uh, support. So we've got, uh, QMU has a virtual machine type uh, which uh, provide, uses VertIO for everything, um, or mostly for devices, many devices at least. Uh, so what it does is, we've got a, a few things here. We've got uh, a function that will uh, map early device memory. Um, things, mostly things like the UART. It also allows you to use uh, larger pages for devices, which may help with TLB pressure. Uh, you've got a function to start the non-boot CPUs. So 
we assume we start booting on CPU 0 some stage later in, in the future, we're going to want to start CPU 1, for example, if there is a, a CPU 1. And you've got a function to tell the kernel, actually, yes, there is a CPU 1, there's a CPU 2, etc. So it tells, you, it tells the kernel the, number, you know, uh, the maximum CPU ID and, uh, the, and the number of CPUs. And then the kernel can, uh, can then go and run the previous function, the start AP, for or, or each of these. Or uh, start AP, if, if this return tells the kernel, yes, there's more than one CPU in the system. Uh, and there's a little bit of information down here at the bottom, which I'll explain a little bit later. So, yeah, platform is, so it's K-Obj based, so if you've done any device driver programming on FreeBSD, you'll, you'll, be you'll have been familiar with that. Uh, and because it's K-Obj based, we can, we've got all these other functions which you don't, you can implement, which you don't have to. Um, so we can do things where, uh, as just after you've probed for which, which um, and you've, you've got a successful probe of saying, yes, this, is, this object is for this piece of hardware. We can run the attach function. So the same, similar to an attach in the device. Uh, we've got things like uh, trying, yeah, finding the last address of kernel address space, uh, find, uh, initializing GPIO. So if you need to handle something just before the console comes up, um, doing something after the console is ready, and uh, the special one of when, right at the end, rebooting. Um, and then there is uh, this platform probe, which I say, yeah, don't use. It's only, it's magic and it's used by the, uh, if the file descriptor um, table, the other flattened device tree tables. Um, there it goes. It's there for, um, it handles uh, the magic of figuring out which device, uh, which, which K-Obj object to use. So I said, you know, there's this magic piece of macro, there's magic macro at the bottom. Um, this handles the magic to figure out which platform object do we actually need to use. Uh, so it has We've got vert, you know, so we're saying this is, this is the uh, QMU uh, virtual machine uh, object, uh, um, descriptor, where we say well, we'll have this vert uh, variable, which just magic means we'll use uh, vert methods um, variable for it to find the methods. And, you know, we have a, a human readable name because you can actually override uh, which object you're, you're planning on using, the, the kernel wants to use. So if you're wanting to test something, you can override it. Um, they have a zero because we have to have a, a size of a soft C even though we don't use it. I, we probably should just remove that and force it to zero. Um, we have a FDT, uh, we have a compatibility string. So uh, in, in the top of each um, device tree um, file, there is a, this this device tree is compatible with the, this, this hardware. And so we can use this to select exactly which, uh, which object we're using. Um, and we have this, um, this number, magic one, which is a imaginary, um, if you're going, th when you're, uh, if you've got a, a, a delay function, we do a busy loop. Um, and early on, when we don't know exactly what hardware we'll have, we need to know how many iterations through this loop we need to, of just doing nothing, do we need to iterate for uh, one microsecond. Um, and because this is QMU and time is imaginary, we can just say one is the smallest allowed value. So yeah, there's, there's a number of examples of these. We've got other, other slightly more complex versions if you need multiple different um, platforms pointing at the same methods. Um, so the IMX6 from uh, Freescale, now XP, soon to be Qualcomm, 
uses, I think they have three or four different, I think it was three, three different compatibility strings uh, for single core, dual core, quad core. Um, so it can handle, you know, it can handle multiple options. But then we get to the next problem of, well, I, I've sort of briefly touched on it, of device enumeration. Um, we, uh, if, uh, yeah, so memory mapped devices are generally not uh, non enumerable. So there's not an easy, you have to figure out what the base address and what the size of the mapping is somehow. Uh, you could potentially create a, a, a device at a known location that helps you enumerate. Um, but that hasn't been done, so we, we have to, given in the constraints, we need to figure out where devices are in memory. Uh, the other problem was the kernel had a hard-coded list of devices and their location uh, in memory, which makes it difficult if you want to then suddenly change to another um, piece of hardware which has a different set of devices in a different locations. Um, so, we could just have the firmware provide it to us. Um, when I say firmware, I also mean you could have the kernel build it in, but it makes it a bit little bit less generic in that case, and that you can only ever run on one piece of hardware. Um, so, a little bit of history. Uh, this was added prior to ARMv6, I think, I believe it was funded by the foundation um, through Semihar. Um, so there's some early, some Marvel ARMv5 parts which were, Warner, you have a comment? Juniper funded. Uh, Juniper was it? Juniper funded. Okay, um, so yeah, it was at least, it was added before ARMv6 to ARM. Um, and uh, it's, it was an early requirement for ARMv6, so all, all kernel configs have to, ha have to use FTT. Um, there's also a large list of every architecture that's not Spark 64, I think, um, that it's optional on. Um, it, yes, but I think Juniper might be using it for AMD 64. Yes. Um, and we're trying to prod risk 5 people to, to adopt it as well, or something very, to, so that we don't have to have another format we have to pass in the kernel. Uh, so if, you've, if you're used to ACPI, uh, part of what ACPI has is, is similar to FDT in that it has a big list of, here's, here's some devices that may not be enumerable in, uh, in it. Yeah, um, so if you're, uh, it may, it's more common on ARM64, I think, well at least it's common on ARM64 that you have this um, because it has the same issue where you can't enumerate uh, memory map devices uh, without external information. Um, so here's my very minimal example of FDT, of, of a DTS. Um, so we have a, a few bits of information here. We have a unique board and SOC names. So this is what the platform code uses to de detect uh, which, which hardware it's running on. So all it is saying is it's a name um, value pair um, where the values may be an array, which in this case it's an array of two strings. But uh, we have a, some RAM, so uh, that's saying memory starts at that address and is this long. Uh, we have a device, and this is my, my SOC vendor's device, which has in their device. And then we have, as, as with the RAM, we have a address that the device is located in, in memory and a range and a number of um, size of the memory that it's, we should map. We should map. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, is a, and there, there may be more information in here. There could be things like interrupts as well, um, but I, it's quite difficult to fit too much more on, onto a single slide. And uh, yeah, so we have this this memory range. Um, 
so if this we this this gets then compiled into a device uh, blob, so it's a DTB, uh, which is a it's just binary representation of the same information. Um, so you can you can then decompile it back into get extract the source out again, uh, and yeah, we normally then give this to uBoot to part or the uBLDR to, uh, to pass into the kernel on boot, uh, so that we could have. We don't. The kernel then doesn't need to know about exactly what hardware it's running on before it know before it can enumerate the hardware. So th this still means you may have a, a per hardware a U boot, but that's firmware, so we sort of have to live with that. And so, a sort of graphical overview of of it is we have we have a, we have some sort of bus, which this is this could be a speed memory. Inside the bus, you know, as it's mapped, and then they could have some a simple bus inside, and some devices, and then a, a separate, completely separate one, simple bus. So we've we can have more, quite complex structures. It's it's all tree based, and you know, so you can build up exactly a, a description of the hardware, and you know, so. Uh, writing device drivers, you just check. You just need to check with with it, because it came out of uh, I think it came out of PowerPC on Linux, where they wanted to convert, have a format where you could convert the uh, device tree information to something this this flattened format. So everything is um, open firmware based. You know, so it looks like it looks like open firmware to the kernel. So we we all see things like open firm, OFW bus status okay is just checking that the you haven't disabled that device and uh, and that the device is compatible. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's plenty of examples though. So this is just you know showing how you would attach. So we've got we've we've managed to figure out you know enumerate hardware, and we've got. Uh, Booted into at least device, yeah. D you know, we've, we've booted, we've started enumerating hardware. Um, so we can, yeah, you know, this is at the point now we can boot a full kernel. Um, the problem is that we've still got these singleton functions where you can build a, build a kernel and you might be able to run it on a few different, very quite closely related architectures. Um, but you couldn't run it on something with. Um, Say two different uh, timers, because you've got a, a new problem of the delay function needs to be implemented by each timer. Uh, so this was um, e e every time you wanted to create, if you wanted to create your own timer, uh, you just said this delay function which waits some number of microseconds for um, in a busy loop. And this was, you know, this is, right, you know, so we, my, my solution was we just do a callback, easy. We need to, you know, it doesn't really, it just needs to have another function that waits, does this busy loop. Um, we can, each timer then can register, <coughs> and because you tend to only ever have one timer in your hard, in your SAC, we, we just have a single. You just overwrite whoever whoever was the last to register. They they're the current timer. Um, they're the current implementation of delay. And that's I don't think I've seen any hardware which has this has ever been a problem. We've got two timers that uh, we may do something like only call this on the first if you only on, on the first time you're attaching a a, a timer, but. Um, that seems to it seems to work, um, but yeah, it's you have to you have to then figure out you know actually, the problem is you you still have to figure out you still have to wait this this time. Um, so what this is just a quick example of is figuring out you've got some you've got a you're you're, you're figuring out you've got some uh, amount number of um, counts you need to you sleep, and you just have in a in the loop, waiting until the timer is counted up to something large enough. 
Um, I'm not particularly happy with this method of doing it, but um, I th I'm thinking I, I need to rework it slightly, but I'm not exactly happy with my, my reworking of having a function that returns how many count, what, what the current counter value is. Um, it doesn't work particularly well with a busy, uh, the early, early, early boot loop, um, loop. So I'm still thinking about a, a better way of doing this. And then we can then use this. So the, the early, yeah, the early boot loop. This this one is a wee bit more difficult if I wanted to rework it. Um, but you'll notice, so that that delay count is the the magic one I pointed out in the platform definition. Um, you probably we, we, the other issue is we're not entirely sure. Well, we we need to be able to figure out how to calibrate this value other than just choosing a random number like 100, which seems to be OK for most hardware. <coughs> um, yeah, this, it's, yeah, like I say, I'm not, I'm not necessarily exactly hap um, happy with the, the current code, but it seems to work. And it's given us a chance to at least run on, you know, with, uh, even on inside the family of SOCs, they often have different timers for um, slightly different um, different SOCs, but we you know we've still got um, interrupts, which are they're even more of a more of a problem for the issue of singletons, um, and that we were only ever able to handle a single interrupt controller, and even more so we were only ever able to it, sometimes interrupt controllers cha are chained, um, and so we now have to think about that. Um, I example of that was the uh, the Samsung the MV4 Samsung, which I, I did the uh, a part of I did part of the work to port FreeBSD to um, had something like that where you had a interrupt controller then on certain interrupts there were children interrupt, um, which was a wee bit of a pain to handle. I um, made some special cases for these, um, but luckily. We have uh, this new um, new framework into an NG. Uh, so this was started in 2012 by uh, Jacob, who um, is the, for the summer of code. It's um, he sort of got a, you know, I think he's got a reasonable amount of it working. Um, then, we, then we had some a couple of. Um, developers working on it to um, get it into a, a committable state um, before before it was important in 2015. So it's still reasonably new in this, and it's only been in for a few about two years. Um, it's optional in ARM and in MIPS. I've um, it's required in ARM64, and actually I have made it a requirement on v 6 about a, two weeks ago. So it's, still, it's optional on ARM on, on v4 and 5 if one doesn't remove them. Uh, so you, this one, so it's similar to uh, with um, devices, and you have a, you suddenly have, you have a tree of interrupt controllers. They don't necessarily need to be children um, in the device tree in the, the device sense. Uh, they could be, you can have cross links between an interrupt controller over here and an interrupt controller over there. Um, and it doesn't actually have to be an actual, what, you, what you think of as an interrupt controller, a, pro, you know, a programmable interrupt controller. It could be something, for example, like a GPIO, where that, your way that you want to uh, have a, a function run when the GPIO toggles and you know, pretend, just use that as an interrupt. Um, so we've got a few. It's new. It's based on Newbus, so um, you create some interfaces. Um, you these do these handle things like um, bind, you know, create a uh, mapping from FDT to internal value, for example, for the map interrupt, uh, or assigning you know, bind assigns um, interrupts to a CPU. Um, so, 
go through an example. So we, the user inserts into, into a SD card. So this, this will toggle a GPIO, for example, in this case. Um, the interrupt controller then sends, the, so the read there is the uh, ARM assembler code. It then calls into interrupt NG because it needs to do a dispatch somehow. And it turns out in this device there are two possible devices it could use. Uh, in case of the, the generic ARM interrupt controller, the, the JIC, is the one that's attached and is registered as the root controller. Um, there is a, you know, we can still build with the Broadcom controller in um, because we, we no longer have a requirement for each, each controller to implement the exact same named function. Um, so the interrupt gets passed into there. And then it passes it down to a GPIO driver. So the, the, the JIC driver doesn't actually know, it just knows that you've raised an interrupt on a GPIO. It doesn't know which GPIO, for example. So the, you may have 32 pins coming in. They all get multiplexed into a single interrupt. Uh, so the GPIO driver then is the one that knows exactly how those are, uh, how, how to figure out which of those pins is actually caused the interrupt. And then that's will pass just as a standard interrupt to the MMC driver. So yeah, this is you can sort of see it's a it's a standard flow. It's not easy flow. This is these are the how things get called and um, that simplifies things a lot, I think, for uh, hand, handling of the interrupts in devices um, where where this is this could be the case. It means we could also we could potentially have a second interrupt a jack chained off the first one, for example. That um, there is support for that. I don't know of any hardware that FreeBSD uh, supports that do that. Does that? Um, there could also be other interesting um, layouts with, uh, for example, with Beehive, we could have a virtualized um, interrupt controller. Um, so we need to then send. We we receive the interrupt. We need to send it to a guest, a Beehive guest. Um, but this this code into ng basically lets us write, uh, you know, do it, run t move to runtime detection over uh, compile time op options. Yeah. So yeah, we've got all these bits, and but just having lots of bits doesn't really mean you've got a generic kernel. There's still you still have to put it all together. So uh, this was at EuroBSD Con last year. I um, I did a, I did a test merge of we've got the Vert kernel which runs on QMU and we have the all winner actually it was the all winner SMP kernel, so which runs on all winner um, hardware or some all winner hardware, um, and I managed to boot. I got it booting on, on QMU, and then Emmanuel got it booting on the same, exactly the same kernel on an all winner um, board. Um, so we, you know, we'd prove that we've got, you know, generics too, isn't it? You know, once, you, once you can boot off two, two things, that's, you can be done. Um, and then later on in the in EuroBSCCon, um, you, Emmanuel gave, you gave a talk on. Uh, all one, the support of FreeBSD on all winner um, mentioned there's no generic kernel in RMv6 and subversion, so I committed it. In the middle of the talk, um, to, to just to, you know, by the time the talk was done, it was, the talk was out of date. <laughs> <laughs> Which I pointed out in the question section at the end. Yeah, so we had yeah, we at least got something running. You know, we got we got two kernels, uh, two two two, two um, SOCs running with the same kernel config. Um, then we you know, two turns out two is not quite enough. You probably want to run on a few more. Um, now I think we run on all um, v seven all winner platforms that FreeBSD supports. 
Uh, we might even run on Pine 64. I'm not sure. On 32-bit mode, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if anyone tested it. I'm not sure if anyone, yeah. No, we're not sure if anyone's tested it. So we may, we may also support um, you know, uh, that platform. Uh, we support the TI parts that we, um, I'm not sure. I definitely run the AM, so AM335X is the uh, Beagle Bone Black. Um, that requires, yeah, that's, and OMAP4 is Panda Board. Um, I haven't actually, I've got a Panda Board, but I haven't, I've never actually tested on there. Um, I just look, um, we support Raspberry Pi 2 and probably 3. I think that I have actually, I think people have actually booted that one into 32 bit mode. Um, and we support the NVIDIA Tegra. This is not the Tegra 2, this is um, a newer um, version of the hardware. And so, as I said earlier, RM v6, I've made, I, as, as a way of putting it, to, you know, forcing people to clean up the code, I've um, now made into an NG um, a requirement on RM v6. Uh, this will help, this is intended to help get more kernels and you know, more SOC supported than generic. Um, also it means that people, you know, go, we can hopefully then finally remove the old, old, old support for the, on ARMv6 at least, for um, the pre interview ng code. Um, I've got almost all of the uh, ARMv6 kernel configs using platform. Um, platform SMP is just the SMP support. <laughs> Um, Malval is a pain um, with that. I think I've got some ideas on how to support that. Um, and many support multi delay. So I think we're actually getting quite close to just having everything, every every RMV7 every uh, kernel running being generic. Um, the Because of the issues I said earlier, there's some differences in uh, cache and validation between RMv6 and RMv7. I don't think Raspberry Pi 1 will be on this list. Um, it's, uh, it'd be nice, I think we, if we wanted to move towards an RMv7 um, target arch, then it, sh it definitely won't be. Uh, so target, yeah, release scripts have been built, updated. So I think the current snapshots for everything that's not BeagleBone for Many are, um, for many of the all in the parts at least are uh, now actually uh, running off generic. Um, so we could do therefore then do updates for these if we had um, yeah, in package base for example. Um, and I've up, we've updated NanoBSD. Uh, someone should do test Raspberry Pi two. I think that uh, that was one I, the only one I, I remember. Um, I think there might be nano BSD support for Panda board as well, which should be updated if there is. Okay. Uh, I, I maintain that, so I can do that. Yeah, I keep. I, I, yeah, one is just saying he maintains it, so he, uh, he's going to do it. Um, I think it's just, it's just a, a single line change anyway, it's easy. Um, I think once, you know. We should it, once we do that, we can start to remove old old kernel configs so that we don't get people don't get confused as to which one they should use. Um, there's still a few remaining issues. Um, as I see, not not all kernel configs have been converted. There's a few uh, that we either need you know, platform support as for you know, as I said, it's been done for most, but it's not not quite there yet for all of them. Um, you know, or uh, or multi um, delay, or they just haven't been. They have we have got that support, but they just haven't been included in generic and tested. Yeah. Um, old versions of Uboot don't necessarily support um, generic very well. They often assume issue things about how they're booting, uh, or they're missing API or EFI support. Um, so people therefore boot their kernels directly, um, and if you're doing that, you're not passing in the uh, magic structure that 
use, um, loader does, passes in to the kernel, so the kernel can't find its uh, device tree. So it doesn't, you know, so you have to build the device tree into the kernel. Um, uh, Mino, yeah, don't, don't hard code, please. We've already had this problem once, yeah. Um, and I found um, this driver has, this is a cache controller. Um, I think I might have a fix for this. Um, but this, I'm not entirely sure. We seem to do lots of magic on each, uh, each SOC, which is slightly different, even though they should probably be the same. Um, yeah, it's simple. Uh, it's, um, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about each, why people have chosen random values in their, their pure SOC um, configuration for the caching. Um, so, quick summary. I've you know, we've shown um, v generic and v 6 is possible. So, you know, other, other, the other BSDs, if you're, you know, um, wanting to do this, we can just come and talk to me. We, you know, I've worked out, worked through many of the issues. Uh, it's mostly just engineering. It's not, it's, you know, going, going through, banging on things until they break and then trying to fix them. Um, and, yeah, it'd be nice to support more of the SOCs and, I'll, you know, patches are welcome. Are there any questions? Yeah. Is this just in head at the moment, or um, how far back? Uh, so the question is, this, is this just in head? And uh, it is. There's, uh, it's all came in. I, we, I, as I, I only did it late last year, um, and we branched early in the middle of last year, I think. Um, so I've only, we've only done it in head. It's <coughs> still, yeah. It's probably going to be only, um, New in 12. Yep. Yeah, my question is related. Uh, should we use the CO2 in S of MV6 to MFC that? So it should we use, use the. Should, should we use that at our average at uh, MV6 is CO2 to MFC that to 11? Ah, right, so it should we um, just put, say MV6 is tier 2, um, so we can just even see it? I, that's not an issue. It's, it's not changing any, any interfaces, really. It's, um, it's just the issue is there's a lot of, co lot of bits that may, you know, someone would have to go and track down all the commits that have been made. Um, and um, so there's quite a, quite a few different um, changes, you know, in there. Have you given any thought to having a generic U-boot? So generic U-boot? It seems hard. It's impossible. It's impossible, yeah. apparently. Maybe in a few years it will be possible. I, I think what we could do is a generic. Wow. <laughs> we, we might be able to do a generic image that you then may need to have some install, st install step for U boot. Yeah, I have, uh, I have this. Yeah, so we could do that. Um, we just need to work out making sure we've got the correct gaps for different version, some versions of U-Boot you have to put on D, uh, DD to the right part of an SD card and um, some you need to put into a FAT file system. Yeah, yeah. so we, we could, we could I think we could do it. Um, it's just not an easy um, task. So, any, yeah. so what, what in real in the release stream is most compatible with uh, the future generic, like if you're going to say as a testing target into QMU or something like that, uh, as an image. So what's the yeah? So what is most compatible with generic is um, all winner, all of that, all all the all winner SOCs that should be currently supported. Um, and but if you don't have one, a QMU vert um, use there's a nano BSD um, uh, script to build it. And we do support, we do, there's a command line in the configuration file um, to tell you how to uh, run it. Um, you'll need, the only thing is you need UEFI to download, which you can download from the Naro. Okay. Any more? No, nope, thank you.